happy to be here and talk a little bit about my leadership story. Life has a way of giving us opportunities to grow and develop our own leadership stories. And they are always very unique and different for each one of us. And these stories don't need to be compared with each other, but they can be shared as we learn from each other and how we can um, better reach our potential and have a full and complete life. My leadership story began 44 years ago when I married Steve. And I had just graduated with my associate's degree, and I was about to embark upon a career that was the most impactful of my life. I was very excited because the career I had chosen gave me great opportunities to learn and develop my organizational skills. It was very diverse in that I was able to um, utilize human resource and, and conflict negotiations with my workforce. I dabbled in healthcare and sanitation, even developed some culinary arts. I was also able to um, work with clothing and textiles and develop my creative side and do some designing. This was quite a dream job for me. It was something that was versatile and had lots of variety to it. You see, I loved this job, this career that I had chosen. And, but the problem was that society didn't view my career choice as one that helped me reach my potential. They said I was wasting my potential and that if only I was working for pay, that that's where the real potential would have been realized. In reality, I was working as a stay-at-home mom. And it didn't matter how much money that it, what I was doing, it was priceless. You couldn't put a price tag on it. The, what the, the world measures success by accomplishments or salary or titles. And I want to introduce you to some of my accomplishments. My oldest son, Ben, graduated with his master's degree at Wharton and is working as, uh, with a startup company at the current time, developing cancer treatment. And he's the father of seven children. My second son graduated with a bachelor's degree and he is a senior um, executive with PetSmart and is the father of four children. My daughter, graduated with a bachelor's degree in uh, public relations, and she worked with a public relations firm before becoming a mother of three. My daughter graduated with a, a master's in organizational behavior and human resources, and currently is working with Red Ventures, and is expecting her first child. My son graduated with a master's degree, and is working for Dell Computers, and has one child. My daughter, she graduated with a bachelor's degree in, inter in interior design and is working as a designer with Henderson and Butler in Salt Lake City. My son is currently finishing his MHA, Master's in Healthcare Administration, at the University of North Carolina. Judging from the world, it would seem that, according to titles and degrees and education and salary, that maybe I have been somewhat successful. But that's not the standard by which I judge my life and my success. It is the joy and happiness of wonderful adult people, citizens, children of God, who, have, who are loving and kind and dedicated to living good lives, to giving back to those around them, and to raising strong families. Parenting and raising children will be the greatest work that you will ever do. The impact will be felt for generations, and it will be far greater than any career that you may choose to embark on. 
Now, unlike the perfect Instagram photos that I've just shown to you, there are always challenges within every family, and we are not exempt from this. Our family members struggle with depression and anxiety, some with severe anxiety. We have some that struggle with addiction and serious health concerns that need to be addressed on a regular basis. But despite all of this, even those that struggle with testimonies of the church, we recognize and know that happiness in family life comes when based upon the principles and teachings of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Despite the challenges that we have, we know that as we involve the Lord in our lives and in our homes, that we can overcome and work as partners with the Lord to ensure that we are able to meet the needs and challenges and find happiness. Now, some people have asked if raising such a large family and that has seeming to be successful, what were some of our secrets for success? And knowing that many of you in this room are maybe not even in a position yet where you've started families or even have found a spouse, this is advice that can be tucked away and safe for another day, but I strongly encourage that you think through and plan ahead, for that is how you will be most successful. My first suggestion is making sure that you put your family first. This is the most important job that you will have, and it will bring you the greatest joy and happiness and fulfillment in your life. Now in our family, there were times when family was at first, when careers took front row, and where Brother Lundgren became very busy, and he was gone and traveled a lot so that he wasn't as involved as he wanted to be. And there was a time that he even came home from one of his trips and said, I feel like I'm a stranger in my own home. And he kind of was. And that was a point where we reevaluated and prioritized things. And you will need to do that throughout your life, is have those points of reevaluation to make sure that family is first and that you're able to um, keep your priorities straight. My second suggestion is dare to be different when you establish your family culture. You will find that when you find a spouse or when you <coughs> have already married, that you are two individual people that are coming together from very different families. And you will bring those traditions, those feelings, and those patterns with you. But recognize that you are forming a new and a unique family, that you need to purposefully make some decisions about what type of family you want to have. I remember well the day when our oldest son had married, and he announced to the family that he and his family were not coming home for Christmas because they were starting their own family traditions and that they wanted to be independent and be able to decide what it was that they wanted to do for their family. And that really warmed my heart because I was so glad that they were taking this very seriously and not being dependent upon the extended family, but that they wanted to differentiate themselves. It's important that as you grow and develop as a family, that even within the church, there's going to be other families that will do things differently than you. And that's why you want to establish yourself as a unique family group. Whether you decide to have a mission statement or a family motto, it's important that as with your spouse that you establish what your identity will be as a family and what your standards will be. And that brings me to my next suggestion, is to establish boundaries. After all the years of child rearing, I've come down to a simple rule that I think applies in all situations. The role of a parent is to establish boundaries of what is acceptable and unacceptable behavior. The role of the child is to push against those boundaries. Recognize that by establishing boundaries, then you are establishing a secure environment for your child to grow. But they will push against those on a regular basis to make sure that they're still there. So if you're consistent with your, the boundaries that you have established, then it will, it will give a sense of security and a sense of order to your children's life, and this is especially true when they're young. And you will have a lot more order and a lot more 
peace and um, security within your home. And my final suggestion is to play together. This, this is the glue that holds the family together during all of the, the ups and downs that you may have. As you establish relationships, traditions, and those types of activities <coughs> where you can laugh together, you can play together, you can have the happy times, the times around the dinner table where you're sharing the day's events, the Sunday night game night with brownies every Sunday that they all look forward to, your vacations or trips together. It is the playing together that helps the family stay together. The Lord has given us a roadmap by which we can navigate life, and that is the proclamation of the family. And I strongly urge that this would be a, a document that you would use frequently and review often and incorporate and apply as it applies to you in your circumstances. That the, in the last tour of uh, the South Pacific, President Nelson mentioned that we are heading towards trouble times. These types of guidance that the Lord has provided for us will give us the stability that we need to navigate these troubled times that are coming ahead. But as you set your priorities correctly and right, and set your standards, and make sure that you distinguish yourself as being unique and your own family group and play together, you will be able to have success and great happiness within your lives. And I leave these things with you in the name of Jesus Christ. classroom, I teach in here, uh, but I, I'm, un I'm uncomfortable being tied to the podium, but I'll stay up here. I'll, I'll tend to wander or want to wander. Uh, Sister Lundgren and I worked somewhat independently on our thoughts and what we were going to share with you today. I realized as she started talking that we should have put her second. I tried to ask her to be second, and she said, no, she wanted to go first, so she'd leave all the time to me, but what she talked about was significantly more important than the things I'll say. It's wonderful to be at a church university where we can talk about the things of the heart, and we can talk about the spirit, and we can talk about priorities and things that matter most. So I'm going to share with you some great learnings, and I'll run out of time. But I'm going to share with you a story that is more secular and talks more about careers. But again, as I look at these past years that we've had together, uh, our greatest happiness and our greatest satisfaction and fulfillment has come from the family and the church and that everything else that I talk about and share with you have significance, but are less so. So, all stories have a beginning, including our leadership stories. And I think probably they started for each of us before we even remember or recognized. I want to share with you a quick career path so you can recognize where I came from and the things that I share with you and why I think that they're important. I'm an immigrant. A lot of people think, well, I don't think so. You look really American. My family immigrated to the United States of America from Sweden. They came over in the 1950s on a ship called the Grivsholm. They came from Stockholm, Sweden, to New York City, stayed with a Swedish family that were the janitors of the church house in Manhattan, found somebody who needed a car to be driven from New York City to Los Angeles. I don't know how they got their few belongings, two parents and six kids, six kids in this car. They drove across the United States, dropped off my grandmother, the children and my dad, who was the oldest son, 
and his father drove to Los Angeles, dropped the car, and took a bus back to Salt Lake City. I'm firstborn Swedish American. It's important to know because at our university, we have a lot of students from a lot of different backgrounds, and sometimes we view those as barriers and obstacles. I would like to challenge you to think of them as opportunities. Second thing, I had a wonderful childhood. I grew up predominantly in the United States in the Rocky Mountains, but I had a four-year visit to Samoa. I lived in Lotapa, Samoa, which is known as Church College of Western Samoa or Pasenga or Apia. Uh, this is a picture of us at a place called Sliding Rock. Uh, you might recognize one of the people, well, two of the people in there. I'm the uh, little Palangi boy in the white t-shirt. <laughs> Standing to my right is President Hans Tala, counselor in the Laie Temple Presidency. So the experiences in Samoa helped me prepare myself for the experiences that we've had here at BYU Hawaii. That's me as a newly called missionary. Uh, that's my grandmother, Hannah Swedeen, who even upon her death barely spoke any English at all. Uh, very, very Swedish. But I had a chance to go to New Mexico, Arizona, and again work with a very different and diverse, diverse group of people. Uh, I worked with the Navajo, the Hopi, the Zuni, the Apache Indians, worked on the reservations and had a wonderful two-year experience. BYU, I was an undergraduate there, uh, graduated with a degree in business, uh, had a scholarship, lost it, had to work hard, uh, to pay my way through school. Uh, I decided that the best way I could do that was to join the United States Army, which I did. They paid for my schooling and I was a Medical Service Corps officer working predominantly at this hospital, which is Brook Army Medical Center in San Antonio. After four and a half years in the Army, I got out and found a job accidentally in hotels and hospitality. I was looking for a job as a hospital administrator, and I couldn't find employment. Hotels, Marriott Hotels, a small company, 36 hotels, came to San Antonio and had some interviews, and our careers kind of matched. Hospitals had food service, hotels had food service. Hospitals had janitorial, hotels had housekeeping. Hospitals had patient administration, hotels had front desk. The careers matched, they offered me a job. And who would know that 34 years later, I would retire from Marriott Hotels and come to BYU Hawaii. Probably one of the most exciting things that I did there was I was on the founding team that organized Courtyard and developed the Courtyard brand. In 1985, Marriott Hotels had one brand. Now there are brands everywhere. They have 60 brands, but there are hundreds of brands in, in the hotel industry. In 1985, we thought, I wonder if people travel for different reasons and if maybe if we had a second brand, if we could develop a better business model. So we developed the courtyard concept uh, through focus groups, through uh, customer research, through development. Now there's over a thousand courtyards worldwide, uh, and there's over 6,000 Marriott hotels worldwide. I started when there were 36. I retired. My wife and I were called as church service missionaries. We came to BYU Hawaii. We thought we'd be here 18 months. Uh, at the end of that time, uh, the university asked us if we would stay. We said, well, probably can't afford it. We said, no, we'd like you to stay as an employee. So I was hired by the university and now work as an employee while my wife is on her second mission. She's kind of like a mission president plus. She's on her 50th month serving as a church service missionary. 
So she still wears the name tag and they won't let me wear the name tag. <laughs> I think I might embarrass them. So that's kind of a quick story. Diversity, immigration, military, university, Marriott hotels. There's probably four things I would like to share with you as far as learnings. I could share with you dozens and dozens and dozens. But the first thing I would like you to remember, and this is really important in all aspects of your life, is that I like to say you're always interviewed. I think sometimes as young people we get confused and we think, well, I'll live my life and do my things and then I'm going to go have one interview. You're always interviewed. People know you, people recommend you, people talk about you, good or bad. You're making impressions, positive or negative, all the time. Lots of times people forget that. I never interviewed for a job after I joined Marriott Hotels. I was always asked by someone to come take the next job. The same thing happened here at BYU Hawaii is we got a call from the university and said, would you consider coming here and working as a missionary in our hospitality and tourism program? But you're always on stage and you're always interviewing. Uh, it causes me to think that we should be on our best behavior, but that's kind of what the Lord tells us anyway. We ought to be sincere, we ought to be genuine, we ought to be authentic, we ought to care about other people. When we're with them, we should engage with them, realizing that you don't know who in your life is going to be an influencer. You don't know who in your life is going to open a door. You don't know who in your life you may be working for at a later date. So remember that you're always interviewing and that relationships and networking are absolutely important. If you're going to go to a meeting or a reception or an event, I recommend you go early. How many of us run out of the door, it's like, it starts at 6 o'clock, if I go right now, I can maybe get there at 6.05 or 6.01. Why don't you go 10 or 15 minutes early, meet those who are there early, introduce yourself, make a new friend, make a new acquaintance, uh, and just build your, your, your Rolodex, old-fashioned word, build your... Uh, your address book uh, with new contacts and relationships. So you're always networking. You're always interviewing. The next is work hard and then harder. I'm going to share with you two thoughts, and sometimes people think, well, gosh, that's, that's, a, con that's a conflict. He's telling us two different things, which I'm not. But I think that you have to give 100% plus when you're on the job, when you're in your career. Uh, I think this is, a, this is a broad generalization. Sometimes the millennials, the younger groups, the Gen X's, Gen Z's, or whatever gems we have now, I think that uh, to your credit, you value more important things but I think sometimes you tend to not value hard work. Uh, I'm not really an employer right now, but I have a lot of friends who are employers, and their biggest challenge is having young people who will come to work and work hard and give it all they have. So be different than those around you and give it all you have. Mr. Marriott is a, a close friend of ours. Uh, I think he's the uncle instead of the, the, the executive chairman of the board of Marriott. Uh, I get confused sometimes because I think he's family, but I really respect him. And he said two things. He said the price of success is hard work. Not just eight hours, five days a week, but all of our waking hours. He said that has been my experience. And he said no person can get very far on a 40-hour week. Now, my wife and I raised seven children, uh, as you saw. Uh, 
they are successful. We have a happy family. Uh, they're well adjusted. Uh, I was also the vice president and the general manager required to be busy all the time. I was also a bishop. Uh, she was an early morning seminary teacher. We did this all at the same time. And we were able to get it done. So the next thing I want to talk about, knowing when enough is enough and having balance. But when you're at work, put the work in. It will make a huge difference. We have smart people and we have hard workers. And if you're both, you're awfully lucky. I was more of the worker kind than the smart kind. But put in the time that you're being paid for and do more than is expected and don't just do enough to get by. The third thing I'd like to talk about is know when enough is enough. And this is why I say that maybe some people might think, well, you're, you're giving us conflicting information. You need to work hard, but you need to find balance. Just as I said, all these different aspects of our life were going on at the same time. You know, we're handling a bishop call, we're handling a family issue. Uh, teenagers are not easy, they take time. You can't compartmentalize them or say, well, I'll schedule you for Thursday night at 7 o'clock. It just doesn't work that way. So you have to be available and deal with it. But know when enough is enough. Uh, <clears throat> how much do you need? Uh, do you need to be the president? Uh, do you need to be gone seven days a week? Do you need to choose a career that takes you out of the home all the time? Uh, find out what is enough for you and your family. Uh, Sister Lundgren and I have had a very blessed and wonderful life. We have a wonderful home. Uh, we have uh, the ability to travel. We have the ability to come on a mission early. Uh, but could we have had more? Probably. Could I have taken a different career path and earned more money and had better title? Uh, probably. A year ago, I was with the CEO and president of Marriott for all of Asia, Oceania, and the Pacific. We had dinner together. We grew up in Marriott together. <clears throat> and as we were having dinner, he said, you know, I'm oftentimes jealous of you. And I'm thinking, wow, you're like a real big, big guy at Marriott. How could you be jealous? He said, I'm often jealous of you and think about your quality of life and what you're doing and the service you're doing at BYU Hawaii. And sometimes this just doesn't feel worth it to me. So how much do you need and how much do you want? Uh, some years ago, I'll tell a short story. Some years ago, I was approached by a company and they asked me, offered me, a job as the president of the company. And I really wanted it. I was very flattered. And I asked questions like, well, what's the job like? Uh, uh, how much does it pay? You know, uh, where would we live? And they said, uh, kind of need to step away from that. You're going to be the president of the company. So you're going to set your pay, and you're going to determine your role. And uh, it's a big deal. And I really, really want it. But I couldn't quite say no. And as Sister Lundgren and I struggled with it and I talked about that, we just couldn't quite say yes. I said no, couldn't quite say yes. And uh, I was in the temple. And I was sitting there reading outside of the president's office uh, books. We used to have books then that had all the church locations for stakes and wards. And I was looking at stakes and wards in Seattle where this job was. And I was trying to find names of bishops so I could contact them. And a man walks in and he said, how are you doing? I'm waiting for an interview. He said, I told him my situation. He says, well, he said, I don't know why I'm here today, except I believe that I'm here for you. And I thought, that's kind of interesting. He says, brother, he says, all I'll tell you is that the Lord does not need presidents and CEOs as much as he needs honorable priesthood holders, fathers, and husbands. 
And I thought about that, and I realized that my answer was no. So I told the company who offered me this incredible opportunity, no, because it wasn't right for me at that time, and it wasn't right for my family. Since that time, we had a wonderful career, and it went like this instead of like this, but we were happy, we were balanced, we played together, we raised our family together, and we always had enough. So know when enough is enough. We learn that someplace else. In the temple, there's a line or two that talks about we have sufficient, we have enough. The last thing I want to share with you is this is a picture of Honest Abe Lincoln in the United States. Uh, I think he was the 16th president. I'm not a history teacher, but he is. These two ladies know he was the 16th president without guile, incredibly honest, would never take anything that was not his, would not tell a lie. I think that uh, one of the great lessons I learned is that our company that I worked with for 34 years always wanted to be number one. We wanted to be the best and the biggest. But the message was always, <clears throat> we won't do it if it's illegal, we won't do it if it's not ethical, and we won't do it if it's immoral. So managers and vice presidents, as you're making these decisions out there, we want to be the best and the most profitable and the most attractive, but we don't ever want to do something illegal, unethical, or immoral. You will all be faced with hard decisions in your careers. <coughs> You might be asked specifically and directly to do things that you don't feel good about. Or you might just get suggestions or innuendos or the culture which might suggest that it's okay to bend the rules, it's okay to go outside the boundaries, it's okay to do things illegally, and I would say that it's not. I think a great example of that for us is we belong to a worldwide church that's in many countries and has opened the doors in many places. They're highly respected. <clears throat> They're well received by governments and industry. They set a standard, and the standard is you can trust us because what we say, we do. Our word is our bond, and we will never trick you or try to get around you or try to deceive you we say what we say and we mean what we say. So the four thoughts that I have with you is, again, uh, we are always interviewing, work hard and then harder, know when enough is enough, and be honorable, be ethical, and act with integrity. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Kids are to start over at BYU. If you've been here a few years, kids are to start over to do something different than you did. What would you do? I think the thing that I would do, we're in the hospitality and tourism program, is um, we spend a lot of time early on building networks and contacting employers so that our students could have internships and postgraduate employment. I think I pro probably would have slowed that down a little bit uh, and waited until our program got a little bit larger uh, because we have a lot of employers and contacts that are still waiting for their first BYU Hawaii students. So I probably would have, as exciting as that was, slowed that down. Uh, and then I think the other thing that, uh, that I would have done is uh, found more opportunity to be in the classroom. My job has been more administrative and managerial, uh, but I found the thing that I've enjoyed the most about the university is being in the classroom. So I probably would have gone to my colleagues and said, you know, give me another class. So those probably just two things. Sister Lundgren? What would I do differently? Oh my goodness, I wouldn't do a thing differently. <laughs> it was a fabulous experience and a far it far exceeded my expectations, both with working with students and with being a student. And it was not on my radar, 
And that's the one thing I have to say. The Lord has plans for you all, and you sometimes have no clue what the end result is going to be. But as long as you have faith in the Lord and you follow his instructions and inspiration, hang on for the ride. It is, it's a good one. And so it has been a fabulous experience for me. Sister Lundgren didn't say this, or if she did, I was not paying attention, but she also decided to finish up her degree. So she's been a student, and she graduated in April with a Bachelor of Science in Political Science. So. Questions, comments? Helena. Uh, both of you emphasized that the most important work is done in home as a mother and father. And you did mention that you also was the property psychologist and the nurse and in addition to all the things that you mentioned. How would you, uh, what advice would you give single students to be the best possible? One answer, two answers. So, Huckleberry Finn said you can't live a lie, or Tom Sawyer said. One of those two guys said you can't live a lie. I think the most important thing you can do in your home is live the gospel. Live the way you expect your children to live. They can see through it. You can say whatever you want to say, but they know and they listen and they observe and they watch. So live the kind of life that you want them to if I understood your question as far as, as people being single right now, yeah, what can they do to what can you do to prepare and to build? I think that to begin with is to, like you're doing right now, is to become educated and have as many experiences as you can. But really work on relationships with your friends, with your family members. Learn those skills of communicating and getting along and supporting those around you that are meaningful, so that you know how to have healthy relationships, and really engage in trying to find, be purposeful in finding a spouse. And this is not something that just will fall into your lap very often. It's something that needs to be pursued, and I think especially in this day and age, I, you know, I still have two single kids, and, and one daughter that was 31 before she got married. It, it is more difficult in this day and age for people to find spouses and to make that commitment. And so I think you need to just, with the Lord's help, be very purposeful in your desires and in your uh, pursuits of friendships and relationships, but develop good relationships now with roommates and with those that are around you so that you can start to practice those skills that come from being in a 